Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Clark Carlisle, and uh, I'm not just some randomly selected Z-List X footballer. Uh, I'm a specifically requested Z-List X footballer <laughs> for reasons that hopefully will become apparent. Um, Scott and Jamie asked me to come and contribute to this event and, I, and I'm honoured and privileged to do so because my personal journey uh, has been an eventful, quite traumatic one and targeting men, young men, etc. is a passion of mine but generally just targeting society with regards to this issue because I know from my experience there are so many simple things that we can do that can make a hell of a difference. Um, for you to understand where I'm coming from, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about my journey. And I've only got 20 minutes, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, born in Preston, the youngest of three children, uh, and then my younger sister came along at 10, uh, when I was 10 years of age. Uh, underprivileged household, you know, where you relied on food parcels from the church, etc., to, to feed the kids. Um, but my parents taught me some invaluable lessons, you know. You don't need money to have a loving household, you don't need money to have a clean household. Don't need money to learn manners and respect. You know, so that's something that we were brought up with. Um, one of the biggest things that they sold into me was if I apply myself, I can achieve anything. If I commit and dedicate, I can achieve anything. So you can imagine in that environment growing up, food was scarce, treats were even scarcer. My dad was going through depression, although undiagnosed. He just thought he had a cannabis habit and stayed in his room for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on end. I only ever saw him when I was either very good or very bad. And you can imagine that that created a personality type where I wanted to be noticed, fighting for attention. Um, went into school with that desire, uh, wanted to achieve, did fantastically well in, in all areas, blah, 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 blah. So, I started to play football, 17 years of age. Wonderful, signed a professional contract for Blackpool Football Club. You can imagine my dad and my granddad have been there at every game since I was yay high, supporting me all the way along the journey. So on my home debut, one all, playing against Carlisle United, ironically enough, ball flicked on at the front post, I headed in at the back post, winning goal, 93rd minute. Blood coursing through my veins, I run to the stand, the veins popping out where I didn't know there were veins, and then my dad and my granddad and my mum. That was a the moment there that I fell in love with football. That was a moment when all their faith in me was justified. All the hard work came to fruition. And I knew that that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So, things started to go well. I did well. Four years at Blackpool. Went down to QPR. Got a big move. £250,000. Woo! Uh, <laughs> went from £500 a week to £2,000 a week. £5,000 to £20,000. Started to get a bit of localised fame. Started to get into nightclubs for free. You know, started to get attention from girls, started to get free stuff. But more importantly for me, I got an England call, under 21s. So I'm stood there singing the national anthem, mum, dad, granddad in the stand. And I cried like I was a little girl. It was immense. I, I loved it. Again, you know, the, the fruition of all that hard work and application. Get to January of that year, night match, Fulham. Fulham against QPR, local derby, one tackle. ACL, LCL, fuck the tears, ITB, rotate the fibula head, dislodge the nerve, rip the hamstring off. I'm going to go back a step. I'm going to go back to 17 at Blackpool. Just left the highly disciplined household, gone to Blackpool, and mum calls it Sin City. <laughs> Started to get involved in social life, went out one night, met a delectable young lady. She says, Don't worry, don't worry, I'm on the hill. I said, Don't worry, don't worry, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> not an option. Brought up with our values and principles, I am going to try and be a father to this child. But I'm 17, I'm 18, I haven't got a clue. Don't know what I'm doing. Uh, terrible, terrible partner and father at that point. So when I get them into QPR, I'm gone to dust. I think in my head at this point that I'm earning money, so I'll send all this money back to the mother. That's me doing my duty as a father. So we come to this tackle. Not only have I physically abandoned my daughter, I've now financially abandoned her because I've no longer got football. 
football is the reason why everyone's interested in me, it's the reason why I'm successful, it's my raison d'etre. Uh, it's just been taken away. Mum and Dad have got nothing else to be proud of. At that point in time, this is 2001, there, there isn't an understanding that there's psychological, emotional impacts and long term injuries. The physio says, go and have a dream. So I'm in a flat in Acton. I have this wonderful thing in London called Dial and Crate. Now the crate of cars and trees, two bottles of Chablis, 40 miles of light. Six weeks I lived there, locked up in that cycle, not knowing that I was dealing with all this shite. And then I came to the conclusion that I was I was a value to no one. And I took it over, I was 56 cold blocks a month, washed it down with a can Carly, waiting for the inevitable. But fortunately for me, my girlfriend at the time came home, I proposed nothing, she just wanted to bring me some flowers, cheer me up, and she found me in a 2 and 8, took me to hospital, got my stomach pumped. I was supposed to see the psychiatrist before I left the hospital, uh, but the physio wanted to take me to training. So the physio said, can I take him? The psychiatrist said, will you do it again? The physio said, no, we'll make sure not, so I got, I got discharged. The physio said, don't do that again, it's a bit silly. My girlfriend's parents said, uh, typical East London family, why oh, Sam's got away with that one here? Yeah. East London, not Sri Lanka. Whatever that one, don't be getting stupid here. Okay, okay, we'll do it again. I didn't even tell my parents. Couldn't tell them. When you come from a, 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 an underprivileged background and you've got no money, when you're the golden child, you're the one who's actually gone on to do something with your life, you're the one who's earning money, you're the one who's living the dream. How do you go back to your parents and tell them to all that? How do you tell them that you've just tried to kill yourself? It's almost impossible. So I didn't. So then, fortunately, for me, I use the word fortunately, but I'm a Christian lad and I, I, I supplant the word blessed in there. But I like to pick, keep this one, you know, for everyone. So fortunately for me, got back to football. 22 months I was out, went on to play another four or five hundred games. Uh, but through that time, I, I was amazed that cyclically, every four or six months, I'd explode some kind of erratic, irrational behaviour. Didn't know what it was. You know, just boom, clock's gone up, boom, clock's gone on a bender. And originally, I thought it was alcohol, because that used to, that seemed to be the recurring theme. And with the help of the PFA, with their funding, I went to Sporting Chance Clinic, 28 days. Wonderful. Totally changed my, my, my relationship with alcohol. I was sober for two years. After that, I was still, every four or six months, exploding in some kind of irrational way. I'd go missing for four days. I'd go to the casino for two days. I would stay in my house, in my bed, and not phone, speak to, answer mail, answer email. Actually, I, there was one point where I was in my bed for five days. I'd get to training, break down in tears in the car, not be able to go in, so I'd go home, go to bed. I really just thought that I wasn't a nice person. I thought I was someone who repeatedly made bad choices. <clears throat> but then in 2010, my wife had our second child, and uh, she had postnatal depression. I didn't know this. All I knew was that I kept coming down and she'd be crying. We'd just gotten promoted to the Premier League. Beautiful house, two beautiful cars on that. Best contract we've ever been on, two beautiful children. What more do you want, woman? What more can I give you to make you smile? Uh, she, she implored me, she said, Look, I've, I've got postnatal depression, please read up that. So I did. Okay, that's me, that's me, that's me. And I'm plugged up, look, up. I'm reading about postnatal depression. It's like, Yeah, how's Jen? It's like, Yeah, she's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> well, I'm not one of the babies. <laughs> <laughs> it's obvious what, you, you've got the pressure of it. You know, it was an epiphany moment for me because it, it, it made sense of the journey beforehand. It made sense of, of a lot of the erratic and irrational behaviour. But, and this is where I'm going to ask you, if you haven't, um, if you haven't touched base with Ali yet, please do. Please do. It is imperative that you understand the biopsychosocial model around mental health. You know, we have a we 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 have a, a natural tendency to pull strands out of an issue. 
and focus on strands. We're not working with strands. That's why I ain't got any statistics for you. I ain't got any slides. You've got a human being. That's what we're working with. And a human being is an amalgamation of all these things. Now, I thought that 20 milligrams of philosophy was the answer. I thought that was it. The medication, the happy pills. I didn't do anything to try and find out how I got there. I didn't do anything, any of the talking therapies, to wonder what it was about my thinking, what it was about my dysfunctional thinking, what it was about the reasons why I exploded and how I could do anything about it. I didn't learn any new coping strategies or mechanisms. I didn't do that. I did nothing to raise my self-awareness of my personal journey. So I get to 2014, and I throw myself in front of a truck on the A64. 10 ton truck at 60 mile an hour. At that point in my life, I fully believed it was the answer. This was no escapism. I believed that everyone in my life was better off without me. Overcome that natural, basic human instinct to survive and throw yourself in front of the truck? Jeez. So, again, I'm going to come to the faith. You ask a physician, any physician, every outcome will be. 99% of the time you have cares. 1% of the time you have a lot of change in you. I didn't break a bone. I didn't break a bone in my body. Not only that, a year later, I run a marathon. Sorry, I digress. But it's a miracle. You can't tell me miracles like that. How did I get there? What are the things that I learned along the way? Well, we talk about engaging with men. And one of the biggest things for men, something that Ali alluded to, is that... Uh, inherent learned behaviour that you are the provider, you're the friend, you are in control, you are physically dominant, you have such etc. In providing everything for my family, in doing everything that I did without it throughout my career, and this is all, I only learned this by going back through dissecting everything. Just before I pressed that big red button, my thinking was, I'm doing this for the football club, I'm doing that for the community, I'm doing this for the missus, I'm doing that for the children. When have I got something for me? I actually valued a drinking vendor, a gambling vendor, whatever it was, as me time. It was my reward for all my commitment in other areas. There'd be another dynamic. There'd be... The manager's not picking me. I'm not sure if I'm going to be in the team. If I'm not in the team, I don't earn that. Dave, if I don't earn that, I can't pay the bills. If he's not picking me now, my contract's up in a year, will I get another contract? If I don't get a contract, and this club doesn't want me, no one else in this league will want me, I might have to go down to that league, which is going to cut me wage by... I was, I was brought up that there are negative emotions. What are you crying for? Give you something to cry about. Who are you hitting? Oh, hit you. Don't need their record. What are you shouting at? Don't do that in this house. There are no such things as negative emotions. I was an emotional retard when I went into psychiatric hospital. Do you know what there are? There are uncomfortable emotions. But they are just as valid and they exist on the spectrum like the happy ones. And we need to teach people, we need to learn how to deal with those uncomfortable emotions when they arise. We need to give them coping strategies and, and analytical strategies about why they're feeling that way and what they can do about it in a productive manner. I didn't have any of that. So when I get this anxiety, when I get this nervousness, what did I do? I wanted to run away from it. So I drank because when I drank, I didn't give it up. Did not do zero cares. Or I went to the casino because in the casino everyone treated me like a king. They gave me free beer and I sat in a corner. No one bothers you in the casino. I just sat there. I wasn't even playing to win. I was just playing to get away from the status quo. One of the biggest things that I've learned in this 18 month journey is that I need to understand 
what these emotions are when they arise. I need to know what they're apropos of, and I've learned new ways to deal with them. So we're talking about giving people opportunities over this spectrum of activities. Do you know what I found for me? When I wake up in the morning, I have a pot of black coffee, I put some coconut tobacco in my pipe, I stick plastic FM on, and I do a check for my body. It's the perfect start to my day. To my day, not your day, to my day. If that doesn't happen, then I ask myself why. And I don't ask myself why I like in the superstitious, oh no, my day's gone to hell. No. What, why did I not sit and listen to Plastic FM this morning? Oh, do you know what? It was a six hour trip to Exeter last night, and then I went for a walk, and I was really tired. I just needed that extra snooze in bed. Happy days. Get on your bed. Or it's, do you know what? I've got this speaking engagement, and I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm really, really nervous. I'm going to judge me. Right. I need to talk to someone. I've got a council around me now. This council of people only works on one proviso. It's my mum, my brother, my clinical psychiatrist, uh, Colin Bland, a, a sporting chance, uh, and a, a good, trusted friend of mine. Now, this is the key, the key thing to it all in the journey of mental health. This council only works if I'm going to be And it only works if they reciprocate that honesty. I have given them permission to say, Clark, you didn't answer your phone three times last week. Well, what's got this going on? Now? It's not an accusation. It's not an accusation. It's an observation. Just like if I was running around at training and I was limping, and the guy said, "You're limping. You got a tight car." It's not an accusation. It's an observation. And then I am in a position to say, "Do you know what? I just took a knock on it. I can get through it." Or, "Yep, yeah, you're right, Gaffer. I'm going to go and see the physio. I'll have a rub, take a day off, and then I'll be back." Full belt tomorrow, identical with this conversation with my brother, with my mother. Do you know what, Mum? You're right, I was avoiding you, but it was because of this. Have the conversation, everything's back on track. So, the crux of this for me is uh, what I, I, I hope that you guys take home with. I know you guys preaching to the converted. I hate the, the terminology of mental health and mental illness. I, I hate the disparity between the two. Because just like your physical well-being, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum of health. And we fluctuate up and down that spectrum on a daily basis at different times throughout the day. And what you need to know, and this is how you take it into the workplace, what you need to know is a person's norm. What you need to know is your norm. And it's only when you know your norm, that's when you can start to identify variations in such. And when you identify, this guy's usually quite quiet, quite placid, he's all some really chirpy, really barking. When you understand that, that this guy who's usually immaculately dressed and preened, all of a sudden starts turning up three, four, five days a bit dishevelled. When you identify that that lady who's really gregarious and outgoing, all of a sudden he's quite sullen and low for three or four days, that's when you can make the intervention. That's when you can say, how are you? You seem a bit tired today. And you can do that in your workplace. That doesn't take government funding. That doesn't take a massive support network. That doesn't take a strategy. That just takes a level of observation and human interaction. And we can do that for each other. When we do that, that's when we can really start to make a difference in our homes and in our communities. And I know that you know. But it's so important that we get the message out there. Because it might not be relevant to the individual for their personal circumstances. But when you can be the third person in that scenario, and you can interject, you can save someone who's living in ignorance. You can save someone who doesn't know that there's something going on. I have seen it. Thank you so much for your time. If you've got any questions, please do ask. I'm welcome.